Hello, how is everyone? Uh, I'm Nick Johnson, founder of ENS and lead developer, and I'm here to give you an update on what's happened with ENS in the last three years, which is give or take 300 years in crypto. Um, before I actually start, uh, can anyone who's got an ENS card hold it up above their head? Wonderful, probably about half of you. I'm so delighted with how everyone's been doing with this. If the person next to you held a card up, have a word with them, say hi, tap your phone to their card, and you'll get a poem that proves that you, visit, uh, that you met them at DevCon. Uh, we still have a few of these cards left at our booth on level three. Uh, so after the event, come down, we'll print one for you with your ENS name and your ENS avatar on it. Um, we expect we'll run out sometime this evening, so I'm sorry if we don't get to everyone. Um, but this is a great opportunity to meet the person next to you and have cryptographic proof of that afterwards. So uh, first off the agenda, uh, I'm going to recap everything we've done in the last three years and then go on to talk about what we're working on now and what we're working on next. Uh, first of all, in the next category, uh, Thorin, which is ENS's new look and design system and new app. Uh, second of all, talking about scaling ENS uh, with off-chain reads and writes. Uh, next, the name wrapper, which you may have heard about as a way to uh, improve the functionality of ENS names and the ability to issue trustless subdomains. Uh, finally, uh, zero gas DNS integration, how we can use these other components we've built to make ENS integration uh, possible for DNS names without any gas fees. And then the conclusion. So first of all, the recap, it's been a long, long time uh, since I've been at a conference, since I've talked on a stage in front of a lot of people, uh, since I've given anyone an update on ENS. Um, last time I spoke was at last DevCon, in October 2019. Uh, we'd just transitioned from the interim uh, auction registrar to the permanent registrar, uh, featuring its current renewal model. Uh, and uh, that was a mere five months ago. And while it was doing well at the time, we had very little idea of uh, the phenomenon ENS was going to be coming in the next uh, few years. We had about 50 integrations with various wallets, uh, including MetaMask uh, applications such as um, Etherscan uh, and so forth. That's changed a bit in the last three years. Uh, our set of integrations now looks more like this. <laughs> So as you can see, we've come a long way from under 50 integrations to over 500. Uh, we had about 300,000 registrations back in the day. That's now over two and a half million. Uh, we had about 96,000 Ethereum addresses that had interacted with uh, ENS in some way. That's now over a million addresses. Um, 66,700 years of registration had been purchased. That's now over six and a half million. Uh, if you strung them all end-to-end -end figuratively. Uh, and the nascent ENS Treasury had a, a stunning 382 ETH in it at the time. That's now 38,000 ETH. Uh, and I'll talk soon about the DAO and how it's able to put that to use. Of course, it's not all about the numbers. ENS has accomplished a lot on both technical and governance fronts in the past three years. Uh, some of it will seem like old news, but it's been a long time. Uh, at DevCon 5, we had limited DNS integration with only the .xyz TLD supported. Uh, you could uh, take an ENS, uh, sorry, .xyz name, you could import it into ENS and use it just like you would any .eth name. Um, since then, this has been expanded to nearly every top-level domain uh, that supports DNSSEC. So that's nearly 90% of all top-level domains. Uh, nearly any name can now be imported into ENS and used as a native name. Uh, just ask our developer advocate, Luke.computer. Uh, it's printed on his badge, I believe. Um, there are transaction fees associated with importing any of these names. Uh, and at times when gas prices have been very high and the ether price has been very high, uh, it's been quite pricey. But we've uh, got a plan to improve that massively, which I'll talk about shortly. 
Another major improvement has been ENS's transition away from being just a way to name wallets and decentralized content to being a Web3 native identity platform with the introduction of avatar records uh, and text fields that provide information about your profile, such as your Twitter handle, your email address, your ENS name now represents you as your Web3 identity. Uh, it's a universal portable identity. And uh, one project that's been bringing that to more users is sign in with Ethereum. Uh, it started out as an RFP issued by ENS, and it was funded by a joint grant from ENS and the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, Spruce won the bid for that and has done an outstanding job of growing it into the primary way that people authenticate with Ethereum, uh, replacing a plethora of uh, incompatible and, and different standards for signing messages to assert your identity uh, with a symbol system that can be, thank you, uh, that can be um, easily plugged into existing systems, including Web2 legacy systems. But of course, when I talk about the last three years, and particularly the last year, top of most people's minds will be the launch of the ENS DAO, which is now one of the largest and most active DAOs in Web3, uh, which I am absolutely both blown away about. Um, ENS has always aimed for gradual decentralization, starting with the, the minimum set of permissions uh, held by the widest number of people we could, which was the original uh, four of seven multi-sig, uh, unlike most multi-sigs, it included participants from around the ecosystem, not team members, uh, and they had limited powers to upgrade ENS to replace components. Uh, our goal was always to move from that to a system where ENS uh, was governed by a decentralized organization. Uh, since we launched all the way back in 2017, uh, the only example we had to go on was uh, the DAO, which, needless to say, was not a stunning success that inspired us to immediately decentralize. Uh, but things changed a lot, and the DAO space is now a lot more mature than it was in the past. Uh, and we decided that uh, you know, the time had come, that things were mature enough that we could let the ENS community govern ENS. Uh, and the DAO is the major milestone along that path of gradual decentralization. Uh, the DAO is now responsible for almost all governance levers and controls available to ENS, including approving contract upgrades, changes to core parameters such as pricing and how expired names are used. Uh, it's also responsible for treasury grants and uh, projects using the funding gathered from the protocol. Uh, in the year since the DAO's launch, uh, the ENS DAO has shown that it can maintain a high level of civilized discussion. Uh, made useful progress forward in improving the protocol. Uh, besides budgeting and day-to-day -day bookkeeping, it's made meaningful changes to the protocol, including changing how expired names are handled in order to st safeguard the stability and fairness of the system. The DAO has also started to build out public goods and pro uh, grants programs of its own. Uh, one example of this is the uh, small grants rounds that we now run. Uh, inspired by Noun's uh, props room. Uh, this is a regular system where anyone can submit a proposal for work they want to do or work they have done. Anyone with ENS tokens from the DAO can vote on them. Uh, and the top five in each category, we have a public goods category and an ecosystem category, uh, then receive one ETH each in funding to pursue it. Uh, the public goods is focused on anything in the wider ENS ecosystem uh, and the um, ecosystem category is focused more on things that relate directly to ENS. Uh, and we hope this can work to better incubate and start up uh, new projects both for ENS and for the wider public goods on Ethereum and Web3 ecosystem. Working groups have also funded initiatives on scales small to large, uh, ranging from a 200,000k, uh, sorry, 200k ENS token grant uh, to the Protocol Guild, who are formed to help fund core developers uh, throughout the platform. Uh, 169k uh, Gitcoin matching pool, and we continue to fund and support Gitcoin. Um, and smaller projects such as this uh, plugin for discourse forums, which provides you with insight into uh, the roles of delegates uh, and their participation on the forum, uh, which is something that any DAO that uses discourse can take and plug into their own system. Uh, this was built by uh, Karma and integrates with all of their stuff. You can also just use it to provide insight into how your delegates are voted, how active they are, how many tokens they have, and so forth. 
The DAO has also resulted in more community participation in the core protocol. Uh, one major success story is Rafi's work on improving ENS's normalization functions. Uh, normalization is how we handle names like uppercase NIC being different from lowercase NIC, uh, ambiguous emojis, uh, hidden characters, and so forth. Uh, to start, we used a well-tested system called UTS-46, which is what the domain world uses. Um, but it's become clear over time that ENS has some unique requirements, and we wanted to enable things such as emoji and other characters that are popular in the community but not supported directly by DNS. Uh, so Rafi has been working on harmonizing all of this. We're very close to rolling out the new standard for DAO approval, and it will enable a much wider array of characters while also providing more protections against deceptive names. Uh, the last three years has also seen an explosion in community-led ENS initiatives, uh, independent projects that build on top of the ENS ecosystem. Uh, one popular example you may have seen is the ENS leaderboard, uh, which shows uh, people with Twitter handles that contain .eth and their ranking relative to followers. Uh, we've had some pretty popular ones, including Paris Hilton, for instance, right up the top of the leaderboard. Uh, I myself am now ranked, I don't know, number 400 or something. Um, we've uh, had the launch of ENS Vision, which is a third-party ENS trading market. Um, it allows people to now register names from scratch and also trade existing names. Um, and projects such as NIMI, which is a Web3 profile um, site. Uh, it lets you generate a customized profile and in fact the eth.limo gateway folks have integrated with NIMI. So if you have an ENS name that doesn't have content set up, it will automatically show your profile with your POAPs and so forth and you can customize it as you wish. Uh, before we start talking about what's new, one small announcement. Uh, True Names Limited is the name of the development company that builds ENS, the company I founded that gets paid by the DAO, employs about a dozen of us to build out ENS. Uh, when we formed it, we didn't really think of it as a name that would be visible to people. It was purely an internal thing. But in the t intervening time, it's become more and more visible. Uh, and every time we have to say, we're from True Names Limited, the company that develops ENS, and it gets a bit tiresome. So we're renaming to ENS Labs Limited to better reflect uh, what we do and who we are. Uh, so what's next? Uh, first, we're going to talk about Thorin. Thorin is ENS's new design system, and it's built from the ground up with usability and Web3 in mind. We've used it to completely rewrite the ENS app from the ground up. Uh, coupled with improvements to the smart contracts behind ENS, this enables a huge improvement in usability for ENS users. Uh, the ENS UI faces kind of a unique challenge from amongst Web3 apps and, in fact, kind of apps in general, in that it needs to provide an interface that is both easy and user-friendly for new users, but has the advanced levers and, and uh, sophisticated interaction required by advanced users. We don't want to create a situation where uh, the app is sufficiently flexible to do anything with ENS, but deters existing users, which is a little bit the case of the current app, uh, or is so straightforward and wizard-based that you need to go somewhere else if you do have more than basic needs. Uh, by surfacing the important details and flows, while still making advanced functionality available under the covers. Uh, the front-end team have done an outstanding job of writing an app that uh, is all for all users. Aside from the functional improvements, we've hugely improved the loading times uh, and made the new app 100% mobile friendly. Uh, the new app is at feature parity and live now on the Gurley testnet. Uh, would be live on Ropston, but that's already been deprecated. Um, and uh, you can try it out now at alpha.ens domains. Uh, just to emphasize, it's only on Gurley. It is a little bit, um, you know, sharp edges still. Uh, the team really raced to get it out in time and did an amazing job. Uh, please send us your bug reports, but we aim to have this uh, launch on mainnet shortly after DevCon, once the name wrapper and other contracts are approved by the DAO, as I'll discuss shortly. So keep your eyes peeled. Thorin isn't just for ENS either. We've made it available as a standard React library that anyone can use for their Web3 apps. Uh, you can check it out on thorin.ens domains. Uh, and you may have noticed it powering a number of our uh, other sites, such as the Swag uh, microsite uh, and so forth. Uh, one of our major ongoing projects is scaling ENS. 
Uh, for many projects, this is accomplished by going multi-chain, deploying to just multiple chains. If you're Uniswap, for instance, you fragment your liquidity, liquidity a bit, but you can work uh, in parallel across multiple chains. ENS is in kind of a unique position here. We need to maintain a single cohesive registry of names, and it's far too early in the L2 and the roll-up ecosystem to pick a single service as the winner that we're going to migrate to. Instead, we've been pursuing options that make it possible for people to host their ENS names anywhere without the resolving having to know or care where that is. Earlier this year, we launched CCIP Read as a collaboration between ENS and Chainlink. While previous systems, such as bridging, often introduce new trust assumptions and require L1 transactions to execute, CCIP Read uses a lower level primitive, proofs, which means that in many cases, such as with L2s, this can be done with no additional trust assumptions over those the L2 itself requires, meaning you could host your ENS name on Optimism, have users resolve it from any client that doesn't know what Optimism is, uh, without introducing any additional trust that uh, relies on the gateway operator, for instance. Uh, further, the solution is far more flexible than bridging, allowing data to be stored not just on L2s or sidechains, but on arbitrary systems, including centralized databases. At its core, ENS is a way for any contracts to fetch data from off-chain resources. Because contracts can't directly talk HTTP requests, this ends up being a little bit like having one of those conversations uh, with a couple who have had a fight and are refusing to talk to each other. Well, you tell the gateway that I think that they should give you this data I need. So the conversation tends to go like that. Uh, unfortunately, just ask them yourself isn't an option, so the client has no choice but to play middleman. The end result is good. Uh, with the resolver and the gateway agreeing on a protocol, it's possible for the client to facilitate a lookup of off-chain data without any knowledge of what their shared language is or what the off-chain system in, in use is. Uh, the necessary proofs to make this trustless are encapsulated in the response sent by the gateway and verified by the resolver before returning the result from the name resolution. This means that implementing the base protocol is enough to enable all current and future L2s and off-chain storage systems to be used in the ENS name resolution. For instance, uh, Ethers already supports this, which means that you can resolve any ENS name that uses it, even if it uses an L2 that didn't exist when the Ethers implementation was written. Uh, CCIP Read is already in use in production. Uh, both Ethers and Web3.js uh, support it. Um, and so if you use either of those libraries, or in fact, as of, I believe, today, uh, web3.py, um, upgrading to the latest version will mean you automatically support uh, ENS off-chain resolution. Some of the largest apps and wallets have already upgraded to support it too, including Metabase, uh, Meta, Metamask, uh, Coinbase Wallet, as well as Ethereum, uh, Etherscan. There's a long way to go in terms of making this latest change universal, uh, so please reach out to your favorite wallets and apps uh, if you see that they don't support these new names and ask them to let them know how important it is. Uh, like our uh, Thorin, uh, CCIP Read also isn't just for ENS. It can be used to add uh, off-chain resolution support to any project. Uh, Coinbase has gone a step further than just integrating CCIP Read for name resolution. They're using CCIP Read, ENS wildcard support, and ENS's DNS integration together to allow their wallet, uh, their wallet users to create ENS names under the .cb.id domain for free. These names will instantly work in any wallet or DAP that supports ENS's new resolution improvements, and they have no transaction fees to set up for either users or Coinbase. Likewise, uh, Lens is using CCIP Read to integrate their own .lens naming system with ENS. Any .lens name, you can add .x, uh, sorry, .xyz to the end, and it will resolve in Metamask or any other wallet that supports this. Uh, so off-chain read support is great, but how do we enable writes? The default option for every platform is to provide its own interface for users to update their records, meaning if you use Coinbase Wallet, you have to use Coinbase to update your records. If you use Metamask, you'd have to update with Metamask. Um, but this leads to fragmentation and makes general purpose apps like our own manager much less useful. 
Fixing this is still a work in progress, uh, but EP5559 lays out a way forward by enabling a discovery mechanism that allows clients, uh, such as our manager, to discover how they can send a transaction or an HTTP request to update data that's stored off-chain. Um, it currently supports writing to uh, EVM-based L2s or sidechains, um, or sending signed messages to an HTTP API, but this is extensible with new methods as they crop up. Uh, adding support for this to the NS manager and further standardizing the best practices and making it as, as flexible and extensible as possible is an active area of research and development for the team. Uh, so next up, the name wrapper, which you've probably heard about of griping about on Twitter because uh, it's been underway for a while. Um, ENS predates all of the NFT standards, and while the .eth registrar was written after EAP721 came out, that functionality only applies to .eth second-level domains. So nick.eth, but not uh, wallet.nick.eth, or nick.xyz, or whatnot. Uh, as a result, not all ENS names can be uh, transferred, exchanged, etc., using standard NFT interfaces. Uh, further, one of the main advantages of tradability is trustless ownership. If somebody sells you a name or a subdomain or gives it to you, uh, you want to make sure that they can't take it back next week and set it to a different address. Uh, you're kind of reliant on their goodwill. There are solutions to work around this. You can uh, give ownership of the name to a contract, and we've had a system for that called uh, now.ens.domains for some time. But it has significant shortcomings in that you're committing your name to a specific contract where it has to live for the rest of time, uh, which limits what you can do with it. Uh, the name wrapper solves both these problems. It allows any ENS name at any level, whether it's a .eth or a subdomain or a DNS name, uh, to be wrapped as an ERC-1155 NFT. It also allows owners of wrapped names to revoke permissions, such as the ability to replace or delete subdomains by a mechanism we call fuses. Fuses allow the owner of a name to revoke their own control and that of any subsequent owners over certain functionality on a name, such as the ability to unwrap it again, uh, to create or to replace subdomains, uh, to uh, transfer it to another user, and so forth. Once a fuse is burned, that fuse can't be reset until the name expires, giving a user a guarantee as to what can be done to or with their names until the name uh, expiration is reached. The name wrapper tracks these permissions and provides a very easy API for fetching the set of restrictions currently applied to a name and when they'll expire. Uh, alongside the name wrapper, we've also implemented a suite of other contract improvements, including to the .eth registrar controller, uh, the reverse registrar, and the public resolver. Uh, altogether, these will prevent a much smoother registration process for end users and cut down on the number of transactions and gas required, as well as other quality of life improvements, like allowing contract owners to set primary names for their contracts. Uh, the long and the short of this is that with the new .eth registrar, you will be able to uh, register a name, wrap it uh, in order to set permissions, burn fuses, and set your primary name all in a single transaction and using less gas than doing those operations would cost today. Uh, all of these updates are live now on the Gurley testnet uh, and we're planning to submit them to the DAO for approval on mainnet uh, very shortly after DevCon. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, finally, I'm going to talk about something else I'm excited we'll be able to release soon, gasless DNS integration. Presently, claiming a DNS name in ENS costs a substantial amount of gas. It's about 100k to a million gas uh, per signature it has to verify. Uh, depending on the ether and gas price, that can range anywhere from uh, 20 bucks to, at the extremes of the bull market, $1,000. Uh, obviously, this isn't a particularly scalable solution. Um, and so this can be a, a substantial barrier to DNS integration. Fortunately, we have a plan for reducing this all the way to zero. Uh, so first, a quick overview of how DNS works. Uh, it uses a chain of trust, just like SSL. Uh, the root zone is signed by a well-known certificate authority, and they sign keys for each of the subdomains, such as .com, .link, etc. Uh, each of those zones uses its keys to sign this, the, its subdomains, and so on and so forth. Our current DNS integration uses this to allow users to claim DNS names inside DNS. Our front end collects up all the complete set of proofs necessary and submits them to a smart contract, which verifies the signatures, and if they match, it lets them claim the name. 
Uh, if you've been paying attention to the talk so far, this may sound quite familiar to you, uh, similar to something else we've discussed, CCIP read. If we treat the whole of ENS as a massive off-chain distributed database, we can have a gateway that fetches DNS data, collects all the proofs necessary, and submits it to the chain, just like uh, when you're resolving a name. So then we can write a resolver for DNS names that uses that gateway to resolve uh, names in ENS entirely using data stored in DNS. Users can set DNS records to configure their name uh, and they will resolve any through where ENS is supported with zero on-chain transactions necessary. Claiming on-chain may still be useful in some cases, for example, if you need uh, granular control over the subdomains, uh, but for most users, it'll be possible to claim your DNS name just by setting some text records. We're working on this right now. The DNSSEC Oracle changes are done, and we're working on implementing fixes from an audit before we roll it out. We hope you have it ready to go before the end of the year. Uh, there's been a lot more going on in, with ENS, but compressing four years uh, down into 25 minutes naturally means I have to leave some things out. Uh, just one more thing. The DAO is nearly a year old, but still in its infancy. Uh, we have a lot, of a lot to learn and a lot to do, and we need your expertise. Uh, please take a look at our governance page, uh, reach out to ENS Domains on Twitter, see how you can get involved and help us build a, a truly decentralized public good uh, naming for Web3. Uh, and that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Do we have any questions for Nick? Please raise your hand. We'll get you a mic. There's a lot of things that we talked about. There. We see a hand over there. Keep your hands raised so we can find you and get the mic to you. Hi, Nick. Hi. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, one thing I was thinking about, uh, you should probably be able to use uh, ENS to... Uh, the problem is when you use UI to, uh, to communicate with a page, the MetaMask will generate you, uh, it will provide a transaction for you, and basically you have no idea like if actually the UI is the right UI and you, if you are calling the contract you want to be calling. And I guess you could UNS, you could, you, you, you could UNS for this for linking both the, uh, the domain and the smart contracts with the same ENS and have MetaMask check it basically to provide a lot of attacks co uh, connected with the UI yes. spoofing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, better user insight into transactions is I think probably the major uh, adoption barrier and, and phishing and so forth, to, forth issue in Web3 today. Um, Naming contracts with ENS names is one big step towards making that a bit better. And in fact, the latest contract updates we're pushing out uh, make it easier for contracts to get ENS primary names. Um, I am also the author of a proposal with Richard Moore on how to better provide insight into transactions, which is also very relevant there. Yeah, and could you make uh, basically the, the calls from the other side? meaning um, MetaMask could somehow check with DNS, like what, what this contract uh, mm -hmm. is, what ENS is this contract associated with? Yes, uh, and further, you could uh, put authorized front ends in your ENS records so that it will warn you if you're making a transaction to say Uniswap from a scammy site, which is an excellent idea. Yeah, perfect, perfect, thanks. Cool, thank you very much. Awesome, we have one last question here, just at the, the front row, and uh, then we'll be at time. Uh, hi, I was wondering if you could kind of give us a state of the union on efforts to resolve pages via browsers in, at the OS level. Sure, uh, so at the OS level is, depending on how you look at it, tricky or easy. Uh, you can run your own DNS resolver, in which case you personally get to resolve all ENS names. Getting it rolled out to everybody is a very steep hill to climb. Um, I think we're going to have more success getting this integrated into browsers such as Brave and Opera, which already support it, uh, rather than integrated directly with OSs. Um, on the other hand, there are efforts around .eth, uh, talking to Ethiopia about whether they would be willing to relinquish that. Uh, this is all very nascent, however, so there's, there's nothing uh, concrete for that right now. The shorter term solution is, as I said, browsers, I think. Awesome. That's all the time we have. Please give Nick a big round of applause. Yeah.